There have been almost five months of virtual stalemate on the battlefields of Ukraine, and yet Europe and America are clear that Kiev won't get the fighter aircraft and long-range weapon systems it wants. So what's the grand plan as seen from Brussels? Is there one? My guest is Charles Michel, president of the European Council. This is very clear that we do everything in order to guarantee the territorial sovereignty and integrity of Ukraine. It means the victory of Ukraine. Let's be extremely clear. And what about the confusion over EU policy on China? President Macron says Taiwan isn't Europe's business. Europe's foreign policy chief says it really is. Whatever happened to unity in the European Union? Charles Michel, welcome to Conflict Zone. Thank you. Let's talk first about the war in Ukraine, if we may. For the past few months, there's been very little movement on the battlefields of Ukraine. The West, EU included, has given large amounts of aid and weapons, but clearly not enough to move the war in Kiev's direction. Isn't the danger now that you're beginning to normalise a stalemate? It's very clear that on the EU side we are determined to do everything to support Ukraine as much as we can. And uh, you, you are absolutely right that uh, very quickly after the start of the full-scale invasion launched by uh, Russia, we decided to provide military equipment. This is the first time in European Union history that we took such a decision. And since then, together with our partners, our allies across the world, uh, we provide military support to Ukraine, we provide financial uh, means to Ukraine, we help Ukraine uh, on, support, the, but on, not on the humanitarian enough. side. It's not you, enough you, to you, move you, the you know, war forward, I is give it? You, I give you one other example. Uh, a few weeks uh, ago, we took the decision to, to work together, the EU member states, to produce ammunition, because we feel that this is needed to strengthen our defense industrial basis in order to speed up. And you are absolutely right that it's important to do everything to, to accelerate the effort. This is really important that uh, uh, the Ukrainians uh, made the choice to, to resist. They are extremely uh, courageous. And this is a tragedy uh, for them. And that's why our duty, our responsibility is to do everything we can in order to assist, to, to support uh, them. And of course, like but the, but you... They're, they're, not in, they're not impressed with the um, relationship relationship with the EU at the moment. Ukraine's foreign minister, Dmitry Kuleba, has complained bitterly that the EU was failing to implement its own decision on, on the ammunition, to purchase ammunition for the country, because member states were arguing over which suppliers they should actually and since, and since, sign a contract. With. And since that statement made by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, we had the occasion to clarify with the Ukrainian authorities. And you know that we are in but constant, time was wasted. We are, we are in constant contact with uh, President Zelensky and with the Ukrainian authorities. And I can reassure you that uh, they know uh, that we are reliable friends and reliable partners. And they also know that uh, this is not uh, a magic bullet. We do everything to speed up. We have uh, taken significant political uh, decisions. This is very clear that there is a strong political choice on this EU side to, 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 to be active in our support to Ukraine. But there are realities. That, that there is no magic bullet. Uh, for instance, we need to make sure that we will produce more ammunition uh, in the weeks and months to come. Mr. Kuleba's deputy, Andre Melnik, says that war fatigue among EU members is now the biggest challenge for his country. There's a feeling, he said, that now the tank issue has been settled, people can put their feet up. A lot of them still don't understand that the war is far from over. Is he right to worry about war fatigue in the EU? No, it is very clear that uh, we, we need to convince our citizens across the EU uh, what's at stake is the future of the European Union, the future of our, our citizens, our security, our prosperity. But look, um, if, uh, if we look at the situation a few months ago, I'm absolutely convinced that uh, Putin's calculation was uh, the war fatigue, was the impossibility for the European Union to stick together to be united. And we took Putin and the Kremlin by surprise because we are able to stick together, we are able to have the support of our public opinion across the European Union, and we were able, we have been able to, to 
to, 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 to stick together with our uh, Northern America allies and other partners across the world. You say that, but your foreign policy chief, Josep Borrell, said recently, forging and maintaining EU unity against Russia's invasion has not always been easy. Some states complained, others disagreed, but in the end we maintained the unity. So you've papered over the cracks. What, what could open those cracks up again? This is, this is very clear that uh, unity, it requires a lot of effort, but the, the, the facts are the facts. We have been able, for instance, uh, to sanction Russia. You remember that uh, a lot uh, has been set uh, on uh, some risks of, uh, of uh, fragmentation on the EU side. We uh, took decisions all together uh, on 10 packages of uh, sanctions and we are implementing these packages of sanctions. We are working all together to mobilize the international community on the international stage. We are working with Africa, with the Indo-Pacific, with Latin America in order to explain, to argue, in order to try to convince. You, and you, have, done, you have done a lot on sanctions. Can I just, you know, make a point here? But you're still using vast quantities of Russian oil supplied mainly by laundromat countries. These are countries that launder the oil from Moscow and sell it on to you. China, India, Turkey, UAE and Singapore. Do you know about this? Yeah, but look... look what, You're buying what, what, laundered what, Russian what, oil. What was, what was the situation a, a few months ago? Only a few months ago, we were on the European uh, soil uh, broadly dependent on uh, Russian fossil fuels. And only in a few months, we succeeded to take decisions in order to, to reduce our dependencies, and the goal is to end those dependencies on, Russi on, on Russian uh, fossil fuels. This is why didn't very, you close this, this loophole? Very clear. Why and didn't you close this loophole? This is, this is what we are doing. We are working very hard in order to close all the different loopholes. But please, would you prefer the European Union uh, not in a position to guarantee the supply of energy resources for our businesses, for our households? Would you uh, prefer uh, the collapse of the European Union? I suppose that is not what. Uh, you are advocating for, and that's why we need to be reasonable, to be rational, and to be determined. It's exactly what we are doing. On the one hand, uh, we do not lose our long-term strategy. We want more renewable energy on the EU side. We want, we want more uh, independence in terms of uh, energy policy on the EU side, but we need also to make sure that uh, we, we, we defend our economic basis and that we defend uh, the social situation of our citizens. You mentioned the risk of uh, war fatigue. And you are right, it's very important to work in order to avoid being victim of such a risk if we want to keep the support of our citizens. This is extremely important to, to demonstrate that we are working in order also to overcome the, uh, the energy challenges, for instance. Yeah, but if you want to do something about war fatigue, isn't it time for a clear explanation of the EU's strategic objectives for Ukraine and Russia? Plenty of generalised promises we've heard from the EU. You told Ukraine in February, the European Union will support you in every way we can for as long as it takes. But the, but the can, I, can I just ask the question, for as long as what takes? What exactly does this promise mean? This is very clear. And the way you are asking the question is interesting because uh, it shows that I'm not exactly following your approach. In our approach, it's not the EU uh, which has the responsibility to, to decide when uh, it no, will No, but be. you made the promise. P please, please, let me see. you give me the occasion to answer your question, I will, I will answer with pleasure your, your question. We see that the Ukrainians, they have the responsibility because this is a sovereign country uh, to decide uh, when and uh, what, and which are the elements uh, in, a, in order to, to assess when this is time to, 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 to open a new, a new chapter. And that's why uh, we are supporting this peace formula uh, uh, developed and proposed by President Zelensky. And that's why we are also supporting this idea to have uh, an, an, in, an international peace uh, summit in order to defend the Ukrainian position inspired by what we believe in, the multilateral order, the rules-based international order, the territorial integrity and sovereignty uh, of the different uh, of of, of nations across the world. Is the EU scared of Russia? You said in February, we're not intimidated and will not be intimidated by the Kremlin because Ukraine and the EU are family. But the truth is that the West is very much intimidated by Russia, isn't it? The only reason for not giving Kiev the weapons it wants is your fear of escalation but, um, and, and perhaps of nuclear 
conflict. And this is very clear, you remember, at the beginning of the war launched by Russia, this was important for us on the one hand to support Ukraine, on the other hand, uh, not to be part uh, in the conflict, in order to, to avoid any risk of escalation. And this is very clear, if I take the example of the nuclear weapons, that we are extremely firm when we engage with China, for instance, in order to uh, convince the international community, China including, uh, to be very firm and very clear the use and even the threat of nuclear weapons is not responsible uh, and uh, we need to do everything in order to make sure it will not be used. When we support the United Nations in Zaporizhia, for instance, in order to prevent uh, any risk of escalation, it shows that we are serious, we are responsible. And again, the Ukrainian uh, people and the Ukrainian authorities, they, they know exactly uh, what we are doing in order to help them to resist. We're more than a year into this war, which may well define Europe's security architecture for generations to come. And we're still not sure what the EU's objectives are. So, so what is the big plan? Because what scenario do you envisage? Eternal war, a frozen conflict? After all the killing and destruction, these two countries are not going to just shake hands and be friends, are they? What, what, what's the big plan? for if this war, when this war, finally comes to an end. The big plan and, and the promise of the European Union is peace, security and prosperity. And the situation is extremely uh, Easy serious. Easy to say. Easy it's, to it's say. And, and difficult to implement. You're absolutely right. Uh, but it's also what uh, we did and what we have been doing uh, for decades uh, across the European continent. But this is very, very clear that uh, what we face is a tragedy first for the Ukrainian people. Second, it has a, an impact on the security and the prosperity uh, across um, Europe. And that's why I, I strongly believe in what we call the strategic autonomy of the European Union. I think that this conflict is showing that it's very important to act in three uh, different uh, strengths. First, energy, energy independence. I don't need to uh, explain a lot why this is so important, and this is very clear with that uh, conflict. Second point, European defense together with NATO, within NATO, but this is very clear and we are acting that what we did in the past on the European soil when some member states decided uh, to uh, reduce the investments in defense, we can see today we need uh, security tools, we need security uh, capabilities. It means that we need more coordination at the European level. And point three, innovation and economic basis in order to guarantee the prosperity. These are the three, the three major pillars. And we have a vision. Why? Because we think that the future of Ukraine and Moldova is within the EU. This is a very clear message. This is a very clear plan for the future of the European continent. And while President Zelensky is not getting all the weapons he wants, what, what if Ukraine starts losing this war. Is there a contingency plan for that? What if Russia, against the odds, starts winning more battles on the ground, occupying further territory? What if you wake up and it's too late? to get, get Ukraine the weapons it needs. A Russian victory cannot be an option, and that's why we support Ukraine. And uh, I've understood that uh, you have your own impression about what we are doing. I can guarantee you that all the member states, all the European leaders, they know what's at stake. I You're saying you will not uh, let uh, Russia uh, win. Are you, are you making is, that this, promise? This is very clear. And this is why this You're is making very, that promise. This is very clear that we do everything in order to guarantee the territorial sovereignty and integrity of Ukraine. It means the victory of Ukraine. Let's be extremely clear. However long and it will, takes. And However never, long it takes. And I will, as long as it takes. And I can repeat, repeat it several times, this uh, commitment expressed by 27 heads of states. I can tell you, I will never forget, it was a very emotional moment, the first uh, virtual meeting with President Zelensky a few hours after the start of the full sea invasion. The 27 European leaders were around the same table with President Zelensky participating virtually in that meeting. I can tell you that all all of us, all of us, we immediately felt the seriousness, the importance of that moment. And that's why only in a few hours we have been able to take fundamental decisions in terms of support for Ukraine and sanctions against Russia. You've spoken by phone to Vladimir Putin over the course of the last year. If you had to pick one concrete result from 
the conversation, from the discussion, what would it be? Yeah, when I had phone calls with him after the start of the full-scale invasion, after the start, the yes, start of the yes, war, when, when I had do, those phone calls, we had the occasion to, to focus on some humanitarian challenges, and I can give you an example. One but concrete I, result. Yeah, but this is, uh, this is very important to allow some humanitarian agencies, uh, the Red Cross, for instance, and I was in close contact with this organization, to make sure that they would have access to some territories in order to provide some support. Certain example, the exchange of prisoners uh, very quickly after the, the start of the war, the tolls started uh, through some international agencies on the exchange of prisoners. These are two examples. And in point three, I, 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 I think it's very important also uh, to, to, to advocate, because even when there is a war, there are rules, there are principles, and this is uh, why we are so committed to make sure that there will be accountability. Uh, there is no place for impunity. Are you in the camp that uh, says we shouldn't humiliate Mr. Putin? These, these are not words that I would uh, use because uh, this is very clear that uh, Putin is trying to humiliate a big part of the world, starting with uh, the Ukrainians. And the so you don't have much sympathy uh, with Monsieur Macron's view? I, 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 I have sympathy with Mr. Macron, but I wouldn't have used uh, this, uh, this, uh, th this word. Uh, what, is very, what is very clear, this is very important also to engage with the rest of the world. This is very important because... We have our own uh, vision and, and we, we, we have a very strong case, we have a very strong uh, principles that we need to, to, to defend. And this is also the DNA of the European Union, the multilateral cooperation, uh, this one thing. But it's very important also to engage with Africa, to engage with Latin America, to engage with the Indo-Pacific region. In order to counter the Russian fake and or false narratives. And, and, and why? And why not just the are, Russian we, narratives as it's, well, is exactly, it? It's not just the Russian. Can, why, can we and talk why, about China? I because feel, yes. I, I'd really like to move on to China because Beijing has been awarded a lot of face time by European leaders. You yourself met Xi Jinping last year. I was struck by your comment on the meeting when you said that both the EU and China have an interest in a rules-based world with the UN Charter at its core. Really? Given China's illegal expansion in the South China Sea and the massive human rights violations taking place inside the country, it's clear they're not working from the same UN rule book as you are. So why suggest there's a common approach to a rules-based world when there clearly, when there clearly isn't? Yeah. First, first I, I, I strongly believe in the multilateral approach. I, I strongly believe in the, the UN Charter. This it wasn't one my first. question. But I will answer your, your, your question. Uh, my second point is uh, that uh, I'm not naive. We, we, we know we can observe that uh, China would like to set the international rules and these are rules that, would not, that wouldn't be inspired by the same values that we have on the EU side for, 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 for instance. And I see three points in our relationship with, uh, with China. First, we will be always very firm uh, in protecting and defending the human rights and the democratic principles. This is very clear. And, and systematically, when I had the occasion to talk with the Chinese authorities, I have systematically the, the occasion to, 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 to explain our, our convictions on those questions, point one. Po point two, I am absolutely convinced that we need to rebalance the economic relationship between China and the European Union. And this is, this is the idea uh, to de-risk uh, our relationship with China. Uh, yeah, but you flattered, you flattered them with, for yeah, no reason at all, this saying is, that they were you know, no, interested not, in the same rules-based no, world this is, this is not as you are. This is not serious to use this uh, word. This is not, my, this is not uh, how, how, how I am uh, acting with regard to China. And point three, uh, if we are serious on the EU side uh, on climate change, if we are serious uh, on some uh, security challenges, we need to, to talk to China. We need to engage with China. It doesn't mean that we agree uh, on uh, all those topics with China. Let's take climate change, for instance. It's very important to try to convince China to be much more active, to put in place a carbon pricing mechanism, for instance. Let's take COVID-19 COVID and health, for instance. If we want to address those challenges in the future, we need to talk with them and with other countries in the world. Look. Um, I'd like to come back to the issue of human rights, which, which you stressed. You didn't please everyone on your trip. Ten major human rights groups 
are incensed that you've reopened what they called the meaningless human rights dialogues with Beijing, which was suspended in 2019, after the EU sanctioned Chinese officials involved in human rights violations. Fair point by those groups, isn't it? Because the talks so far have changed nothing and will continue to change nothing. You agree to talk about, no, I, you, you agree listen, to talk about human rights and they agree to ignore I would like the to, discussion. I would, like, I would like to ask you a question. Do you think that uh, if we would stay in Brussels, if we would uh, send a communique from Brussels on those topics, we would achieve something? I'm absolutely convinced that we would achieve Nothing. And that's why it's very important to engage. And for instance, uh, I'm very proud. Why that, uh, engage I'm without I'm, results? I'm very, proud, I'm very proud that after the meeting we had with President Xi in December, uh, we've been able to relaunch this human rights dialogue uh, with Spain because this is the occasion for us to advocate, to mention con concrete cases and to try to, to defend, to really defend uh, the, hum the, the human rights uh, principles, the democratic uh, And without uh, any results. And, and you have without any results. But, I, I, I fully disagree. You think, if I follow your approach, uh, it means that uh, we would be more efficient by uh, staying uh, here uh, in Brussels without engaging. Of course, it takes time. Of course, it's difficult. I am not saying that uh, we are delivering uh, in one minute or in one second, but I am convinced that if we do not engage, it is absolutely certain that we will not deliver. When we engage, we open the door in order to do everything to deliver. Just very briefly, your, the human rights groups, the 10 major human rights groups, don't agree with you at all. They say having a human rights dialogue with China cannot seriously be an end in itself. They want what, you to tie, the a to tie a dialogue to real human rights progress, including in Xinjiang and Tibet. But this is what we are doing. This, this is a very strange uh, point of view. Because this is exactly what we are doing. When we are discussing with China, we are discussing without any taboo on all those questions. Yeah, but can you point to a single aspect of human rights in China that these talks have altered for the better in the past? Can you? Since COVID-19, those stores were put on hold and we succeeded to relaunch uh, those stores. Before? Stores. Before? Yeah, but uh, since COVID-19, it was uh, uh, put on hold in, 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 in total. And we have again, we have again a political space, a political dialogue to engage with, those, uh, with, with, this, uh, with this country on all the topics that uh, needs to be discussed. And, very, and, by the way, and by the way, before my trip to, to China, I, I, I had the occasion to meet uh, many representatives of those human rights uh, organizations. And, uh, and this was very important because it was the occasion for me to listen to them and to use also the arguments that they, that, uh, that they, they, they shared with me. Earlier this year, China played host to France's President Macron, who took a bunch of business with, businessmen with him to sign trade deals, and then decided to open up a rift between Europe and the US over Taiwan. The great risk Europe faces, he said, is that it gets caught up in crises that are not ours, which prevents it from building its strategic autonomy. Isn't it the height of irresponsibility to highlight divisions with your most important ally, America, at a time when both Russia and China have joined forces to erode human rights and the rule of law. Two, two topics. There is a very clear uh, European position. Uh, our alliance with the United States is very strong and very uh, powerful. Uh, this is extremely clear, point one. And point two, uh, on Taiwan, there is also a very clear European position. Uh, we do not accept the attempt to, uh, to, to change in an unilateral way the status quo uh, in the Taiwan Strait, point, point one. Uh, and we uh, recognize the one China policy. This is the uh, traditional European policy and nothing uh, is changed uh, with regard well, to Well, your, uh, with, your with foreign that policy chief, Josep Borrell, publicly slapped down Monsieur Macron by saying EU members should actually deploy warships to patrol the Taiwan Strait in order to deter Beijing's aggression. How are you going to sort out these differences of opinion? on China within the European no, Union? No, two different things. First, this uh, proposal made by Josep Borrell, it will be the responsibility of the member states to discuss the topic, and this is the, 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 the responsibility of uh, Josep Borrell to put some proposals on the table, point one. Well, point, Macron point is two, saying it's not the EU's point business, two, and Borrell is saying it point is. Point two. The, Borrell saying and, it is, and, and, clear and, and France is very active in the Indo-Pacific region, which shows that France is, uh, has a real interest for that, uh, for that uh, region. But let me tell you that um, I'm aware that um, in the press, in the media, uh, especially 
especially uh, the recent uh, days or, or weeks, the, the, there is an impression of uh, huge divisions uh, on the European side uh, on China. On it's the not impressions, China. they're real. No, they? this is not the reality. I will tell you because I, I, I think that I know a little bit what are the sensitivities uh, in the in the chance. And I can I can tell you that in fact we are much more converging, and I'm very confident that in the following week, and this is the democratic debate we have uh, in Europe in the in the in the weeks to come, we will have the occasion to, to clarify and to have a common position on China. We will have, uh, in June, it's my responsibility to put a topic on the agenda in the European Council, that debate on, on China. We, we are preparing the debate at the ministerial level with the different uh, stakeholders, right. with our partners, with our partners, with our allies. Let me ask you just one specific question because we're running out of time. What's the EU's plan if China invades Taiwan? What's the plan? You, 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 the plan is to do everything to convince uh, China not to make such a mistake. Yeah, this but is, if you fail, what, the then? Yeah, what then? What then? Okay, uh, what then? This, is, this, is plan, this is plan A and plan B. Uh, our partners will count on the European solidarity and responsibility. To do what? In any, in any case. To we, do what? The, 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 you, you, do you remember the, the weeks before the start of the war against uh, Russia? Uh, we worked in close coordination with all our partners in order to assess what would be uh, our reactions, and we will, we will do the same, and we are doing the same with our partners. And it didn't prevent the invasion? Yeah, yeah because in fact, uh, you are absolutely right. There was someone in the Kremlin uh, which, uh, who, who, who took the decision to start a crazy war, the Kremlin's war, and we are doing everything to, 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 to make sure that uh, Ukraine will win, because it's our interest. All right. Jean-Michel, it's been great to have you on Conflict Zone. Thank, Thank you very you. much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.